On a stormy but beautiful evening, I headed north for another adventure. This time, I was joined by Marisa, and we were headed to Michigan. As I went further north, the sky started to clear, and the golden sun shone through the clouds. We arrived at the parking lot for the Pickney Trail. Tall clouds glowed in the orange sunlight as we headed out for the trail. Just moments onto the path, I spotted some second year burdock and some wood sorrel. We continued on and saw what looked like a trail camera, and all around us, we could hear the sounds of animals everywhere. So we're hiking right by a nice little pond, and you can hear all these green frogs that kind of sound like a rubber band being plucked. And there are also the sounds of like woodpeckers in the distance just squawking in the treetops. It's a nice summery evening. Marisa also spotted a small white fungus in the Tyromyces genus. There were also may apples on the forest floor. We entered a section of the trail with pine trees, which gave the forest a nice, open feeling. Here, I saw an interesting looking shrub. So this plant down here is called winged burning bush. It's actually invasive, but it has a really cool pattern on the stems caused by these sort of flared wings that grow out of the stem. And if you look at it, sometimes it almost looks like a weird checkered pattern from afar. Eventually, we came to a junction and checked our progress so far. So we are at point five on the trail, and here the trail splits between the hiking trail and the biking trail. And we're just gonna take a shortcut across the bike trail because it changes our distance from like 6.7 miles to about four miles. And since we're hiking in late, you know, we don't wanna deal with that. So behind me, just off the trail, is some raspberry. It's got these tiny thorns growing on the stem, and the stems also have this sort of like powdery, mildewy substance on it that you can rub off, which is one way to tell it's raspberry rather than blackberry. Ahead, just off the trail, there was a path leading to an old fireplace chimney and root cellar. Whoa, oh, this is cool. These were the remains of a homestead belonging to the Guinan family in the mid to late 1800s. They had come from Ireland and set up a living in the wilderness, raising sheep and subsistence farming. Decades later, in 1949, the forest had reclaimed much of the farm, and the property was sold to the Department of Natural Resources. Dusk now fell upon us, silhouetting the canopy against the blue evening sky. We donned our headlamps and continued onward. Along the trail, we saw a small fowler's toad. So we just came to the intersection where the bike trail ends, which means we have about three miles left until the campsite. Uh, so I will probably just try and make some distance. It's been super mosquito-y out, but it's at least nice and cool and not too hot and humid. I spotted some jewelweed nearby, then, we kept hiking. The dusk sky seemed surprisingly bright next to the darkness of the forest. And in that forest, I found a red baneberry plant, a relative of the doll's eye plant with similarly poisonous berries. Just off the trail, we saw another interesting thing. Whoa. That is so cool. We continued through the woods. Here, I saw some self-heal or heal all plants as well as some sassafras, which has fragrant leaves that can be used for tea. There's a stop sign here, which I assume is... Up ahead, natural. we saw a stop sign and found ourselves emerging onto a road. On the road, we saw flashes of heat lightning and lightning bugs. We were getting closer to our campsite now. We crossed the road, and at the forest's edge, 
found another interesting plant. So this plant over here is sumac, and when it's kind of like nice and red like this with fuzzy little berries, you can actually suck on those or put it in water, and they have this sweet lemony taste. Although after a recent rain, sometimes a lot of that flavor will get washed away. If it has white berries though, you want to avoid it because that is poison sumac, and you don't want to eat that. So at first I thought these little dangly bits were coming from this shrub growing down here. But if you look closely, it's actually a vine wrapped around the stem of the shrub. These dangly bits actually belong to wild yam, so somewhere underground there's like some sort of wild equivalent of a potato. This is also related to Chinese yam, a delicious root you can find at some supermarkets. I kept seeing these little shiny dots in the distance and I think they're like little reflectors in the trees, but then I walked by this shiny little Christmas ornament in one of these pine trees. We also saw a small underripe mayapple fruit and some poke milkweed. Now, we had finally reached the final junction of tonight's hike. All right, we are like super close to our campground. I think just like fractions of a mile left. We're camping at Blind Lake, which is really close to this intersection. Well, I think it's been a pleasant hike, but how do you feel? <laughs> it's been good. It's just very dark. I'm ready for bed. <laughs> On the short hike to the campsite, Marisa spotted a unique looking mushroom. So down here we have Old Man of the Woods, which we've seen before at Wildcat Hollow. But it kind of looks like a craggly old mushroom, but it's actually edible and it looks like there's a slug next to it enjoying it right now. Finally, we arrived at the camping area and found our campsite. So this is a campsite right here actually. We settled in and enjoyed some trail mix and coconut water. Those are good electrolytes. It's got little chunks of coconut too. It's like we're back in Hawaii. So I only just rummaged through to the top of my backpack and found the Nebo light. I wish I had done that sooner because this thing is so incredibly bright. And the whole time we were hiking, we used rechargeable batteries in the headlamps. And I think they are starting to die finally because they were fully charged and they were already turning really dim. But this light is just incredible. I can like see for miles it feels like when this is on. So next time I'm going to remember to make sure I have that. All right, it's cooling down. I put the rain fly on just in case because it was raining on the way here, but I've got the doors open just so we can get some nice air. Hopefully it'll cool down some more, but it's not that bad right now. Time to sleep though. We drifted off to sleep on this unusually cool summer night. The next morning, we broke camp and headed to the nearby pond to check it out. The gentle waters lapped against the shore as we enjoyed the open sky and view. So by this lake, there's all sorts of really cool, familiar plants. To start off, there's sensitive fern, which is a fern that grows natively here in Michigan, but also in Ohio. There's also spice bush right over here, and if you smell it, it's got this like kind of fruity, fruit loopy smell to it. There's also multiflora rose, which is a type of wild rose that actually is invasive to these parts. Luckily, it looks like there's not a whole lot of it. There's also some horsetails growing here. I know they like to grow near water, so that makes sense. And unfortunately, we're not gonna start a fire today, but there's a bunch of beautiful birch trees. That would be perfect for doing that if we needed to. After exploring the pond, I took a moment to enjoy the cool morning air and the openness of the campgrounds. And of course, I had to do a morning kung fu warm up. And the weather this morning is perfect. It's like maybe in the low to mid 60s. 
nice and cool, nice breezy weather. And it actually didn't even get that cold last night. I never felt chilly the way I did on my last trip with Thomas and it's gonna be a nice hike out. With that, we grabbed our bags and headed out. So all along the trail, it's just kind of lined with all of these uh, five-leaved plants. And this is called Virginia creeper. It's a vining plant, pretty harmless. Some people, I think, react to it. But also growing in the midst of that is this stuff, which is poison ivy. It's got the classic three leaves with like specific serrations on the leaves. And also in the middle of the three leaves where they all come together, usually there's like a reddish color. Poison ivy, very important plant to know. But a lot of times I find people get it confused with other plants. So it's good to learn exactly what poison ivy is and isn't. So one tree I keep seeing in this area are hickory trees. They have these compound leaves. Because of the shape of the leaflets on that leaf, a lot of people sometimes when I'm teaching them trees will get that confused with pawpaw, which has a, a leaf that looks very similar to those leaflets. But the key thing is that on a hickory, they're growing on the opposite ends of each other, kind of in this like symmetrical pattern. Whereas with pawpaw, they're kind of growing alternately. We also saw a naked flowered tick trefoil, a plant in the legume family. Another plant I keep seeing on this trail is the autumn olive, which again is not native I think originally from Japan, but if you look at the underside of the leaves, they have this almost thin silvery kind of color or texture to them. The berries later in the fall are decent to eat once they get kind of like shriveled like a raisin. If you eat them before that then they're very astringent and they dry your mouth out. So here it looks pretty invasive, I've actually never seen it this prominent in a forest. There was also a tree with a beer bottle stuck in it. So I'm also noticing Japanese barberry here and there. Not a whole lot of it, but it's got these thin little thorns that grow on it, as well as some like oblong berries that will eventually turn red later in the season. This plant actually almost caused an agricultural disaster because it carried a fungus that infected a lot of wheat plants in the US. I also saw more sassafras and another familiar tree. So this tree is some sort of a dogwood in the genus Cornus. And even though I don't know the exact species, uh, when you learn plants, you can begin to tell what plants in the same genus or family are, which can actually tell you a lot of useful information. Sometimes there's plant families that are generally all edible plants. It's a really useful thing to know for surviving and, and being out in the wild, even in a different environment. But some of the stuff that gave it away for this plant was the fact that it's opposite growing. Um, and also the leaves have these like sort of parallel looking veins in it. But the real test is if you take a leaf, and this is one that was from a branch that dropped on the ground, but if you break it in half, so you can see how there's sort of this like latexy structure holding this leaf together even though it's broken in half. And that's a very definitive characteristic of dogwood. We hiked on, and the forest revealed even more treasures to us, like this pale-leaved sunflower, and this hairy sunflower. So another thing I'm seeing here and there are grapevines. Typically in the woods, grapevines become big and woody, and a lot of times people will confuse them with poison ivy, because poison ivy can also grow into these like big woody vines, but typically poison ivy has a lot of like little hairy tendrils coming off of it, and they'll climb up trees, whereas a lot of times grapevines you'll just see like dangling from the, the treetops. There's also occasionally some grape leaves here and there, but usually when you're in a sunnier area, that's when you'll see more of the grape leaves and more of the delicate greener vines. But the bark of grapevines is decent tinder. I mean, it's not the first choice I would go with because it's kind of hard and crumbly, but if you crumbled it into dust and added it to your tinder bundle, that would definitely help. So these berries down here are what looks to me like blackberries. Obviously they're red and that's because they're underripe still, but in a few weeks they'll probably turn black and nice and juicy. So this plant, I feel like whenever I see it hiking, the leaves really stand out because they're just these like perfect three leaves, smooth looking, they're just a very pleasant shape. Uh, but this belongs to a plant called ground nut. This will often grow like pea pods either above the ground or underground, almost like a peanut. Native Americans used to eat this a lot. Another name for this is hog nut, but the reason it was called that 
set in the first place is because colonists, you know, they wanted to put down Native American culture and insult it and, and make them feel bad for eating the plant. So the, the idea was that like, this was something that only a hog would eat. But in reality, it's a very nutritious and abundant source of food that just grows naturally in the forest. So I don't see any shame in that. Along the trail was another hickory, shagbark specifically, as well as a sugar maple, a green briar vine, and false Solomon seal. There was also white rattlesnake root. As we kept hiking, we saw more self heal flowers and another useful tree. So this is an elm tree. The bark is really distinct. It's always got this sort of like ridgy looking texture, but also if you feel some of the flakes of the bark, it almost has this spongy styrofoam texture to it. Now elm is a really important tree. One, because historically it's been used as a tree by Native Americans to make bows. Uh, it's got really good wood for that. This one looks like it would make a decent tree because it's nice and straight, uh, fairly even. It's also really important for foraging because Morel mushrooms, which are one of the most highly prized mushrooms, tend to grow around dead and dying elm trees. So when you learn to recognize this bark, that's also a way to improve your mushroom hunting and, and to have a better chance at finding morels in the springtime. One of my favorite trees. Up ahead, we saw some flowering spurge, some white trilliums, Profolia bellwort, notable for its stem that seems to grow through its leaves, and maidenhair fern. So dangling in the branches over there were some acorns belonging to some sort of a red oak. And you know, we think of acorns, I feel like the first thing we think of are squirrels, but humans can actually eat acorns too. It just requires a bit of processing. And so what's involved in that process is leaching them of all the tannins. One of the ways I know is to crack open the nuts and kind of let them sit in a bag in running water for like several days. And when it's done, you can kind of mash it up more and cook it over a fire and make this sort of like acorn flour or acorn meal. We pass by another beautiful pond with calm flowing water. And nearby, we found something equally beautiful. So this is a wild chanterelle. This is a really highly prized uh, edible mushroom. And the way mushrooms work is that they're almost like the fruits of a plant. So if you pick one, you're not actually killing any sort of organism. Uh, the fungus is actually all underground and more of these will pop up. But it smells nice and kind of like almost buttery, nice bright orange color. One of the distinctive factors of chanterelles is the fact that they don't have true gills. On the underside of the mushroom, it's actually more like ridges or folds. Uh, so if you're identifying them, that's one way to tell them apart from poisonous lookalikes, like the uh, jack-o'-lantern mushroom, for example. So these, I believe, are a type of juniper tree. Whenever I see some sort of a conifer tree that has a bunch of dead branches like this, whether it's this or uh, hemlock trees or anything else, a lot of times these are perfect firewood because all the branches below, you know, where most of the needles are have already died off and are really nice and dry. But also the bark is very like flaky and fluffy, which would also make perfect tinder. So you could like fluff that up and spark it and start a fire with it. On the ground beneath us, we noticed some slugs oozing along the ground. Further on, we saw another cherry tree, which was also oozing. This is a black cherry tree. A lot of times these trees will just secrete their sap and feels really weird and gross. Sometimes, whenever I've seen this, uh, you know, I've seen it coming out of other cherry trees in like people's yards and it's usually really hard and resinous, but in this case, it's very soft and goopy, kind of like how you would imagine it. But, but black cherries, you can identify just because even from far away, you can tell it's got sort of like this darker flaky bark. Uh, I really wanted to touch this, so. Ooh, oh, it's like jelly. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> Kind of like hard, goopy, like mucus, big old boogers. 
We also saw wild geranium. Up ahead, we stopped on the trail to rest. We hadn't had any breakfast and Marisa was getting hungry, but all we had was trail mix. You eat oatmeal for breakfast, it's basically oatmeal. It's just not oatmeal. If you chew it enough and then switch it around, <laughs> it's like oatmeal. We should have gone to the jerky outlet. We should have brought a fire starting tool. Yes. <laughs> and we could try eating that stuff cold. We could put water in it and just let it get. I kind of thought about that, but that sounds more like a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I spotted some sort of a stone crop plant. And this is, I think, Ohio's only succulent plant. I'm not sure if that's still true in Michigan, but I assume it's a more or less similar environment. But also on the ground, there's this, which is the leaf for a poplar tree. I can see one up there behind me, and when the wind blows through the leaves, they just shake and shiver. With these, it's like every individual leaf is just shivering. It's really beautiful. I also saw a beautiful beech tree, whose leaves are edible in the springtime. One of my favorite trees. And hidden in the leaves, I saw what looked like a juvenile gray tree frog. This is one of those three leaf plants that I feel like maybe some people get confused with poison ivy when they don't know any better. If you look in between here, there's this weird bulbous conglomeration of green seeds. Later in the season, those turn into a deep bright red color. But earlier in the spring, usually around like March or April, this is gonna be a beautiful flower that almost looks like a pitcher plant called Jack in the Pulpit. But it is definitely one of my favorite spring flowers to look for. Now, the trail brought us onto a wooden boardwalk and into a completely different wetland environment. Here, we saw common boneset and joe pie weed, both in the same genus. There was also purple loose strife, an invasive, albeit beautiful, flowering plant. So this is super cool. We're in a wetland area and there are these like thick, juicy looking leaves and they're kind of arrowhead shapes. This is actually a Sagittaria plant, which is commonly called the arrowhead plant, but another common name for it is the Katniss, which is what the character in Hunger Games is actually named after. If you dig it up underneath, there's a big tuber that you can cut open and it's actually an edible tuber full of nutrients. So it's a, a good edible plant. It's also a wetland plant and wetlands are really important. Another plant that is growing here is the cattail in the genus Typha. A lot more people probably know this plant. You know, we see them growing everywhere. They've got the characteristic little corn dog looking flower, but these are also edible. If you pull them up by the base, you can kind of peel the leaves off and chew on the, the middle of it. It's almost like heart of palm or artichoke in texture. I actually don't eat these a lot though because usually I see them growing in areas where there's a lot of traffic or roads and because it's a wetland plant it tends to absorb a lot of the toxins from the water but that's also why wetlands are so important is because they purify our waters as we walked along the boardwalk we saw some eastern larch trees and water hemlock a very deadly poisonous plant okay so there's more sumac growing here and last night we didn't bother trying it but I think today we're gonna give it a taste test. Looks like there's some good bunches. These ones look good here, actually. Mm. Mm. Oh. Yeah, that's really sour. Oh, I like it. It kind of reminds me of like, when you first put a warhead in your mouth, you know? Yeah, it does have that taste. Mm, those ones are really sour. Wow. Yeah, these are very sour. Yeah, ground sumac, they sell that in the international market, yeah. which is like, comes in powdered form. Mm. Now it was back into the woods, where we saw a beautiful and edible flower. This is one of my favorite wildflowers, chicory. It has this beautiful like periwinkle color. I always see it growing like along the highways and along roads. Um, I even see it in just like intersections, like in the cracks in the pavement. I love how like resilient it is. It gets really tall too. And next to it, there's a plant called self heal, which we saw last night, but it's supposed to be a good treatment for various ailments like headaches and stuff like that. We followed the trail onto a road crossing. 
In the ditch next to the road was more purple loosestrife, along with other flowers. By the roadside, you get access to so many other plants that you don't usually see in the forest. And I'm pretty sure this is some sort of a nightshade, although I don't know the exact species, but the flowers are super pretty. And I'm gonna let the narrator fill us in on what this is. But there are all sorts of different species of nightshade. Uh, tomatoes and eggplants are all in that same family, same with peppers. And as you might guess, some nightshade plants are edible, but others are also deadly poisonous. So here we also have a species of goldenrod. One thing I do know about goldenrod is many of the plants are actually good for using as a spindle when you're making a friction fire. So when the stalk kind of dries up and use that for friction fire. There was also red clover. So earlier we saw what looked like hemlock, but here there's also Queen Anne's lace, which is actually kind of a wild carrot. And some of the giveaways are the differences in the leaves, but one of the main characteristics of Queen Anne's lace is oftentimes in the middle of the umbel of flowers, you'll find a single little purple or pink flower. Also, it has a little tutu. Oh yeah. It has a cute little tutu underneath, and poison hemlock does not have a nice little tutu. <laughs> So if you feel the leaves of this plant, they have a very like fuzzy texture, almost like feeling felt or something like that. This is called mullein. The leaves, you know, are pretty good for toilet paper if you need to, but I would make sure it's washed and there's no bugs on it first. The main thing it's known for is being a medicinal plant for your respiratory system. Uh, you can make tea with the flowers or the leaves, but you can also smoke the dried up leaves. I've smoked it before and it actually like goes down really smoothly. When these get bigger and they can grow like several feet high, you can use the stalk once it turns brown as a, another friction fire stalk. Ooh, so, so. Wow, that'd be the best toilet paper. <laughs> We also saw some old puffballs, which puffed out some spores. We passed by the stick hut again and saw another plant. So this is called Virginia knotweed, and one of the characteristics that really stands out about it is the leaves have this like V shape on it. Sometimes they're actually almost a purplish color, but right now it's just sort of a darker green. But these plants are also edible. There's also an invasive knotweed called Japanese knotweed, which is in the same family and it grows near wet areas. But you can also eat those and you can like peel the stalk and kind of eat them like asparagus. We came to a trail junction and found an edible plant. All right, so there's some garlic mustard growing and it does have this like kind of bitter garlicky taste. You really get these like notes of onion and garlic. These are already, it looks like they're going to seed. It's a really highly invasive plant, so it's totally okay to pull them up by the root and eat them if you're in the US and stuff. And while it might not appeal to everybody when it's eaten raw, I like to blend it with like dough and stuff and make garlic infused dough. Uh, another thing you could do is make like pesto out of it. So it's a really good item to use for your like own cooking at home. And you can find plenty of it in the forest and it's really fun to pick and, and eat. So this is wild lettuce and it's got these really distinct looking lobes on the leaves. On the ground, we saw coral fungus and an interesting little elf home nestled at the base of a tree. across this little nook in the in the tree here with a little house here, a little hut. I think it's like a little elf house. There's some coins and there's some stones with like little sigils. I took a trip to Iceland a while back and people there, they believe in the hidden people, which is like elves and, you know, spirits of nature. The forest is home to many plants, mushrooms, animals, and maybe even elven spirits. And in a way, it is our home too. We return to it to find spiritual peace, to reset ourselves and connect with a primal, peaceful past. There are many treasures to see in the forest. When we learn to see them, and how they all interact with each other, we would realize that the forest in itself is a treasure to be cherished forever.
Thank you so much for watching. Consider liking the video and subscribing to our channel. And check out Andrew's personal vlog channel by clicking right here. Thanks again, and we'll see you on our next adventure.